You may be seated. Well, good morning. Welcome to Cider Ridge. My name is Jason. I'm privileged to serve here as senior pastor. It's great to be with you. I want to welcome those of you who are joining us online as well. Uh, Before I jump into uh, my message, I want to echo uh, Kent and Catherine's words of a deep appreciation to you as a congregation as you continually uh, to faithfully support the the vital ministries of, of our church. Uh, this year, as with every, uh, every institution, every organization, is a challenging year. We're, we're feeling the ripple effects, as I know all of you are feeling, uh, of the pandemic. And yet, time and time again, uh, you continually t- uh, faithfully respond uh, in, in some profound ways. Uh, and I would encourage you, if, uh, as we named upward, if, if you have a moment uh, this next week, because they'll practice this next week and, and then take some time off, just step in the building uh, during an upward basketball practice or a game. There is a, an energy and a life uh, that is vibrant and palpable. And know that your gifts uh, make that possible as we come alongside the next generation and teach them um, the faith. So today, uh, we continue on. It's week three of Advent, this, this kind of odd season that Christians, uh, we find ourselves in as we're all kind of uh, have this kind of view of Christmas. We're all channeling our energy toward Christmas. We're finishing our Christmas shopping, or perhaps you haven't even started your Christmas shopping, uh, but we're all kind of targeted for this one day. Uh, but in preparation of that is this season called Advent, a time of, of waiting, a time in which we actually go back and look at some of the Old Testament passages that prepare us for this, this moment. And so this series we've called The Anticipated Christ, and it's been based off of this daily devotional uh, by Brian Zond. And, and if you haven't gotten a copy of these, we still have some extra copies. You can jump right in. It's 10 bucks. Uh, you can also buy it on, on Amazon. But I would encourage you in these next couple of weeks in preparation for Christmas uh, to be reading Scripture daily and the commentary that's associated uh, with it. And, and we're connecting not only what, what we've been studying, studying in this book and looking at some of these passages, we're also connecting those themes to our Advent candles. Each Sunday kind of has a, a theme associated with it. We began uh, a couple of weeks ago with hope and the hope that we have in the birth of this Christ child. Last Sunday, Pastor Todd preached a remarkable sermon on joy and the joy that comes uh, with this season. Today, uh, we heard our candle is on love, and I'll spend some time talking about that, and then next week, we'll talk about peace. And I want to, as we kind of set this this conversation up around love, and and we're going to look at an Old Testament passage here in a moment, I want to remind us something of something I said in week one. So if you weren't here with us, it's okay, but in week one, um, I I named this this reality that we cannot separate the cradle or the, the nativity from the cross. That the incarnation, this, this, this profound theological understanding that God came down to humanity to redeem humanity from within, entered into our space, our time, entered into our flesh. That this act, this incarnational act, wasn't a preparatory act, meaning it's not that on Christmas morning when we celebrate the birth of Jesus, that when God came to us as baby Jesus, that, that then God would just, that Jesus would spend the rest of his life kind of warming up for this, this pinnacle moment on Calvary, the cross. Actually, theologian Catherine Tanner says in her book, Christ is Key, that the incarnation, what we're talking about in preparation for Christmas, is the primary mechanism of atonement. Meaning the incarnation, God coming to earth as Jesus Christ with with human flesh on, is so consequential that to disconnect the cradle and the cross minimizes both stories. That both of those stories, the cross and the cradle, have to go together. And in fact, coming together, they, they make sense. 
Both have become nationalized holidays. We celebrate Easter, and we have Easter gatherings, and and we have uh, Christmas, and we have Christmas parties, and staff gatherings, and Christmas concerts, and they're all wonderful moments. But the two, according to our faith, go together. And this actually was, was one of the first presenting issues of early Christians, is when they looked at Jesus' life from his birth to his teachings to his death and his resurrection, they had to make sense of what was happening. It's kind of like if you've ever witnessed um, kind of a moment of of beauty or a moment of tragedy, and you kind of, you, you pause for a moment and you think to yourself, what did I just see? Your brain begins to fire as you try to make sense of the event that you just witnessed. In many ways, this is what the early church did with Jesus. His birth and his life and the manner of his death and his resurrection caused them to go, wait, what did we just witness? And so in many ways, kind of like puzzle pieces, they started to fit things together. You know, at the, the, the thick of the, the shutdown because of the pandemic, m- many of you, we did the same thing. We, we did puzzles because what else could you do? I mean, and so we'd put a, 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 a table in our living room and, you know, over days we would, you know, somebody might sit down and add two or three puzzle pieces to the image and then somebody walk past, oh, there's the, there's the right piece and they put it in. And over a period of time, slowly the picture began to come in focus. And there was a moment, maybe it was in that kind of putting the last puzzle piece in, or maybe there were just a handful that hadn't been connected, that you go, oh, now I see. Now it makes sense what this image is. And this is what the early church did. Our ancestors in the faith, as they witnessed the miraculous birth of Jesus, as they heard his teachings, as they they bore witness to his death and, and gathered around an empty tomb, they stopped and they started putting the pieces together. And they did this by going back into the Old Testament to find those puzzle pieces. And most often, they did this with the book of Isaiah which if you're following along in the daily devotional that we've encouraged you to do, you've read a lot of Isaiah. Isaiah, we quoted from this morning a couple of times from our call to worship to the Advent uh, wreath liturgy to what we're going to read. Isaiah seems to be one of those puzzle pieces or has multiple puzzle pieces where the early church went back and they said, oh, now we understand what the prophet was telling us. So with that in mind, I want to invite you to turn to Isaiah chapter 52. It's on page 596 in the Black Pew Bible in front or underneath you, or if you brought your own scripture, or pull it up on your smart device. This this passage of scripture, as you're finding your way to Isaiah 52 and 53, is, is the last of four servant songs. These servant songs in Isaiah go all the way back to about Isaiah 40, 41, And they give us some, they're little puzzle pieces that that give us little snippets of who this coming Messiah will be. And this last of the four is, I think, one of the most unsettling of them all. This, I don't know what your Bible says, but in the top of of my Bible, uh, in verse 13, it says, the suffering servant. This is the suffering servant's song. So let, hear these words of Isaiah 52 in verse 13. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and he shall be made high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which has not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, 
and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we shall look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shear is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of many people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, He shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Doesn't that just give you the warm fuzzies of Christmas? Who doesn't want to sing joy to the world right now? I mean, that's, and this is probably part of our our struggle as Western Christians is is we've sanitized or we've sentimentalized Christmas so much and romanticized Christmas so much, which is beautiful and it's wonderful and the lights are great and I love this season. But when we disconnect it from the cross, the incarnation from the cross, passages like this kind of go, well, this doesn't feel like it fits the Christmas narrative anymore. Where's chubby-legged baby Jesus? But this is the puzzle piece we have to look at. This is as the early church looked back, they said, oh, now we see as we fit these servant songs together, as we begin to pull back and we see this great redemption story that God had initiated all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, now we're beginning to see who this Messiah is, this anticipated Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. Isaiah gives us some clues. This Messiah is like a young plant coming up as a, uh, as a root out of dry ground. That This Messiah would not be born into royalty or beauty, but poverty and would be seemingly overlooked, which is exactly what we see in Jesus, born to peasant parents. This Messiah we hear wasn't a looker, Compared to the heroes of history, often men with chiseled abs and sharp chins and bright eyes and bulging biceps. Me. Oh wait, long and flowing hair. Not me. A sword in hand. Those images of the heroes of history, they solicit confidence and power and control and dominance. But we hear this servant this Messiah would be so marred that his, 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 so marred beyond even recognition that he would have no form or majesty that we would look at him. Nothing about his appearance would cause us to desire him. Isaiah tells us this Messiah, as we're fit these puzzle pieces together, would be rejected. He was despised and rejected 
by others. O- on Christmas Eve, if you, if you come back in a couple of weeks, on Christmas Eve, every year we do the same thing. We, we have, you know, great Christmas music. Uh, we, you know, kids will have a, a children's moment. Uh, we'll, we'll have a great sermon. And then all of a sudden the service is coming to an end. And one of the things we'll do is we'll light a candle off the center candle, the Christ candle. And we always read every year the same portion of scripture, John chapter one, the opening of John's gospel. In the word was, uh, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And that great text, But hidden in that little text, that important text, on Christmas night or Christmas Eve night, we will read these words. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. It's the coming together of these puzzle pieces of Isaiah And John saying, this Messiah, this anticipated Christ, would ultimately be rejected even by his own kin. Perhaps most troubling, Isaiah tells us in this passage that this Messiah would suffer and even die. How do you celebrate a deliverer, a Messiah, who dies? But somehow, in some way, this Messiah would take upon himself the sickness and the transgressions of the entire world. And somehow, in some way, through this death, this Messiah would make many righteous. So this raises some questions for us. One, why would God choose to redeem humanity in this manner? Why not just snap a finger and right all the wrongs of the world? Why not come down and in the case of Jesus' day with a, with a sword and kick out the Romans and set Israel free? And the answer is this candle we lit. Love. Now I know that's an easy cop-out of an answer. We have those great songs. All we need is love, right? Right? What the world needs now is love, sweet love. That's the answer to everything. We just need love. But let's be clear about what kind of love we're talking about when it's connected and in relation to the incarnation of God. It is a very particular kind of love. And, and, And we throw this word love around all the time. Partly because in English we have one word that means many things. So an example is the same word that I use to to kind of share my feelings towards my wife or share my feelings toward my children or share my feelings toward my family, share my feelings to my, my siblings in Christ is the same word I use to describe how I feel about a cheeseburger. Because we have one word for love. But love as it's a expressed in relation to this anticipated Christ. It is a self-giving love, a sacrificial love. I mean, think about one of the earliest texts we teach a child to memorize. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, God gave God's Son. Just sit with that phrase for a moment. (laughs) Think of the implications of that passage alone. It's incarnation. It's gospel. It's redemption. It's costly. It's sacrificial. It's it's what love looks like in real time. God loved. God gave God's son. God gave of God's own self to humanity, self-sacrificing in order to redeem and renew the world. Love is costly. But lest we kind of keep this this thought of love just contained in scripture or contained in the category of of theology as some kind of theological conversation, there's, there's practical applications in Isaiah 53 for us as well. Well, I don't want to fully equate love with undue suffering like in Isaiah. 
There is a connection between what we witness in in the suffering servant, the Messiah, the anticipated Christ, doing throughout his life that models for us what expressed love looks like in our relationships. Our love to another person is a self-given love. It's a giving of ourselves to another person. You can't fully love someone without giving them a piece of who you are. It's sacrificial. It requires tremendous vulnerability and humility. It's costly because you can't love somebody fully and it just be about you and your betterment. Love is incarnational. You can't love somebody fully from a distance. It requires proximity, not just physical proximity, proximity of heart. Now, I'm not suggesting that, that this self-giving love means that we, our individual selves, disappear. We are still individuals. And actually, when you love somebody, the way we see revealed in God giving God's Son, you actually become more of who you were created to be in the first place. You become more of yourself when you love. Here's my definition of love. This is my working definition of love. You can tell me if you like it or hate it. Love, whether in a covenant marriage or a friendship or a parent-child relationship, is a mutual expression of self-givenness. It's incarnational, being fully rooted in each other's stories and lives, bearing with one another and embodying in real ways forgiveness and grace for the mutual benefit of one another. That's how I understand what love is. That's the love I see expressed time and time again in Scripture. And the love that we are called to model is a self-given love, a sacrificial love, an incarnational love that embodies grace and forgiveness. This this kind of self-giving idea of love, this sacrificial nature of love is, is what Paul seems to believe love is. And that great 1 Corinthians 13, which is read at almost every wedding ever, love is patient, love is kind, Love's not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own ways. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things all things. This is not a sentimentalized, romantic kind of love. This isn't the love that we we glean from poetry or romance movies. We see this love in Jesus, the anticipated Christ, the incarnational God who comes down, the nature of his birth, his self-giving, his self-sacrificing is a model for us in the ways in which we might love one another, which we hear repeated over and over and over again in Scripture. It stems from Jesus who gave himself in this sacrificial nature, incarnational nature of love. I close with this. Catherine Tanner, who I mentioned at the beginning of my sermon, says this, in the incarnation, God is doing what God is always doing, Attempting to give all that God is to what God is, or to what is not God. Another way of saying this might be, God is always giving God's own self to humanity. Out of love, God gave. Out of love, God refused to remain absent from the brokenness of the world. Out of love in Jesus, God incarnationally entered into that brokenness, absorbed it into his own body, bore pain, rejection, and loss, and tragedy, and ultimately triumphed, bringing redemption to the world. This is what Christmas is about. 
This is what the incarnation, God coming as a little chubby, cute baby is about. A God who gives of God's own self repeatedly and even fully in the Christmas narrative. So because we have been given such love, the invitation for all of us is that we would fully give ourselves then to others so that they too might see and experience the power of incarnational love. Will you pray with me? God, as we are inching our way toward Christmas, in the midst of all the craziness of finalizing shopping and figuring out food and concerts and end of the school year uh, tests and exams and papers, the staff Christmas parties, the stress of seeing family. God, may we in this moment and in the days ahead not lose sight of what this moment, this incarnation the coming of Christ, the suffering servant, means not only for us, but for the entire world. God, as we meditate on this Isaiah text of this suffering servant, we recognize the fullness of the cost when you gave yourself to the world. And God, as we love and interact with others, may we do the same. May we love sacrificially. May we love incarnationally, embodying your grace and your forgiveness in all our relationships, but certainly in the relationships that we hold so dear. We thank you for your profound gift of love, that no matter who we are, no matter what our past or our present reality might be, that you look at us with the lens of love. May we experience that love this Christmas season. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said together, amen. Would you stand as we